Hey everybody, this is your host, Vinyl Man Jeb of the Unlikely Places Pop and Rock Radio podcast section. I'm here with Jerry Steele Fox. How are you, Jerry? Very good. Thank you. No problem. Uh, Jerry actually worked with Andy Hi. Kahn. That brings our connection here together. So you're working with him currently, right? Oh, yeah. Perfect. Uh, well, how did you guys get involved with the, knowing each other and how did that come about? Uh, well, I met him through uh, Buddy Greco Jr. Oh, okay. And, um, yeah, I've seen I seen a lot of his posts on Facebook. And like, mm, curious, you know. So. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Perfect. So we'll get into right with your career and uh, what got you into music. I asked this at everybody. I know it's it's a loaded question, but but what got you into music? Uh, well, my parents. Uh, when I was like way young, they used to listen to a lot of music in the day, you know, and, and used to take me out watch watch live bands and stuff like that. And it's like, oh, that looks like fun. You know, and they bought me yeah. a toy guitar when I was like four or five and, <laughs> and I used to pretend I was a singer and all that stuff, you know. Yeah, the fun you get right in front of the uh, pretend imaginary microphone and you're like, I can do this. <laughs> but that yeah. actually became yeah. something, you know, very cool. And uh, who is your biggest influence as of today? Do you have anybody that you quote unquote making you uh, go into music and, uh, you know, keep uh, you going? Uh, it's the Beatles. There you go. <laughs> Plain and simple. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, the yeah. Beatles have been a, a lot of our guests on the show. It's as we are a power pop show, so it makes sense. Uh, we do have a lot of the uh, oh yeah the Beatle guys, you know, influence extreme influence for me. Badfinger on my end as well. I love Badfinger. Oh yeah, as you could probably see from my profile <laughs> with all the uh, yeah our tribute oh, band yeah. and everything. So it's been very exciting uh, getting to learn all those songs and having fun with that. And they're very challenging, uh, more than I expected. There's like three different guitar parts, and I'm like, oh, which one do I play today? <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, more than I expected than just the records, which is very cool. And uh, I wanted to get yeah. into uh, how did your band, The Wires, come about? Uh, well, um, they they came about before I even joined. It was like, oh. in a, like a, I guess, the winter of 1980. I was walking home with the guy who played drums for the band. They're yeah, I'm in a new band and all that stuff. It's me and Blair. And, and uh, they had this guy, Joe, who, who couldn't play a lick. He didn't even have a bass or nothing like that. And uh telling me about this band and he's like, you should check it out and all that. And uh and then all of a sudden I started getting, you know, bugged by Joe and Blair saying, Join my band, join my band. We need a good bass player or whatever, you know. And it's like, I'll think about it, you know. It was like early eighty one, around like February, and then March I uh, I tried, you know, like gave it a go and all that stuff. And uh yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll join you guys. Then got nothing better to do. So, so perfect. <laughs> that's uh, how that came about. And um, Joe left the band. I became the bass player. And then uh, by uh, April, I, I was like noodling around on a guitar, doing like a simple, like guitar riff, whatever. And uh, it, Blair laughed and said, "You're going to be the lead guitarist." What? Oh no! Oh heck no! <laughs> <laughs> Stay so, away from the scary instrument so with the six like, strings. <laughs> Yeah. So that's what happened. I became the lead guitarist and it's like just uh, learning, you know, all these years, you know, so that's about it, you know. Yeah. And uh, was there any bands after those, uh, after uh, the wires there that you were in as well as a bass player? Yeah. Um, I had a, a band, well, a band called Rock Wave. Okay. It was me and uh, Scott Fetterman, Scott Fetterman and Sean Madden, who was in the wires actually after, uh, after, you know, uh, Larry Wisniewski left you know and um we, we well the wires lasted from 1981 to 1985 and then uh around the summer of 85 that's when we got the rock wave going and all that it was just three-piece group and uh that's about it and then um then after that I, I played in other bands in in the you know in between those bands when i was with the wires and rock wave um i played with a, an oldies band with some older folk Ooh. uh called rhapsody or classics or whatever and then uh i was with a band called click up until 86 and then that's when oh, wow. i joined the navy in 87 so well, thank it, you for your you service know. as well oh wow yeah yeah um it's it's interesting that you know the time period with everything going on it's so cool to get stories from the past um do you have any uh, crazy stories with the bands of like touring anything special from that uh well I mean, there's I, probably I, many like <laughs> well, I have a, I have a few, you know, but it never, never went on a tour or anything like oh, okay. that. No, I never did. No, 
But um, you know, it's like I did do some gigs in other cities, you know, with Beatle mm. tribute bands and stuff. I was with a band uh, it was the Rubber Souls, and they changed it to the Hollywood Beatles. Ooh, okay. And we played up in um, let's say Ventura for the uh, Harvest Festival, and then um, we did a gig up in Seattle for a birthday party. That was really nice. That's cool, Seattle too. That's awesome. I've always wanted to get yeah. out there. That's very cool. Yeah, I went up there twice actually, and then I, I did a gig out in uh, Kansas City, and uh, that was quite interesting, you know. But uh, that was with uh, three different tribute bands, you know, uh, three different uh, Beatle tribute bands. So there you anyway, go. Yeah. Do you have any uh, particular favorite Beatles song to play? Or are they all kind of? I know it's tough. It's like hard to to have that classic like favorite Beatles song. But is there anyone that you prefer playing the most? I don't know. Uh, I've, my for me, my favorite Beatles song period is Nowhere Man. Ooh. You know, but as far as like playing the songs, I have no idea. As like I like I like to rock out on like uh, Let It Be. You know, giving my best Rusty Anderson <laughs> type of thing. You know. There you go. Yeah, I like uh, I'm in, yeah. uh, like I said, the Bad Finger tribute band. And so we do, you know, we run into a lot of the Beatles stuff here. And they always throw a Beatles fest here and uh, on the East Coast here uh, ran by uh, Charles Rosney, who was just recently on our podcast. And uh, oh, nice. he, he runs all the Beatles. So I've met a lot of those bands there. And they're always usually they have like the one or two favorite songs or something. But it's always it's hard to pick. You know, Beatles are so every song is so good. You know, usually it's like yeah. all in between. I know uh, my favorite album is Revolver. So I, I deep dive into that album anytime with anybody because I just love uh, talking, you know, Beatles in general. So it's very cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, one of uh, Rubber Soul is a great album too, and, and Nowhere Man, fantastic song. Um, and it always, what oh, always confused me with the Beatles stuff was the American releases versus the the UK with all the different yeah. like. And it's always confusing because like I'll be on the radio show and I do the radio show airs in England, so I'll do the England releases just so I don't get any comments, you know. And my dad yeah. will come running oh, in yeah. and he'll go, "You got the wrong album for that song," and I'm like. No, I actually, you're right. You are right, but I'm doing the UK releases, so it's always funny to me, but it's just like, it's, you know, that's the only band. I think the Stones did it in the beginning because it was just the way the marketing was, and then they switched quickly over to just doing strictly the same release everywhere because I think what they were trying to do was make more money. It was an honest, I think it was a marketing, which was one of the coolest things to ever see, a marketing thing like that. You do that nowadays. I mean, most bands in the 90s maybe would release two different albums with like an extra song on each or something. I've seen yeah. that a couple times, but it's so rare to see now with any of that. Yeah, I know. And, uh, um, are you on any uh, studio recordings as a session musician at all for baseball? Uh, well, I worked. Well, yeah, um, I worked with uh, Kalista Carradine, who's okay. uh, David Carradine's daughter. Oh. And I was just doing. I played bass and rhythm guitar on a song called "Cry," and uh, it was recorded like maybe I guess 2016, I think, or maybe 17. Oh. I'm not sure. But it was me and a uh, uh, Kalista was singing, and um, and see uh, this guy Bernie Coffee Reynolds. He played piano, Ooh, did some like really me. nice gospel-y kind of stuff, you know. And uh, Alvin Taylor, he's a guy uh, that worked with uh, George yeah. Harrison and Eric Burden and all those. Oh, that's guys, cool. You know? Yeah, I'm gonna try to get him on as well. I was just trying to like catch everybody. I had the two. Andy sent me like a press kit because he has for the band and everything. And I was trying to find it and I couldn't find it. So I'm looking you up online, like trying to get as many best questions as I possibly can. No, and <laughs> it's just so cool. Yeah, it was real meeting Andy too, as I'm a huge Turtles fan and uh, I'm a oh, big yeah. I'm a big Frank Zappa fan too. So it's been like an interesting thing to have uh, being able to talk to Patrice on one end, uh, Zappa's sister, Frank's sister, and then on the other yeah. end, I'm talking to a turtle. You know. Know, and it's like it's really oh, yeah. cool and uh i just yeah. saw howard kalen live i think it, or not howard kalen uh mark volman there we go uh the other uh live oh, wow. um with the happy together tour that they're doing with like the cow sills and all the like all the groups the classic four i think are in there too you got yeah. all the good gigs i try to <laughs> and then yeah. I, I run the record label on the other end and it's it's a lot of fun meeting musicians as yourself and getting to learn stories about uh the history of you know music through eyes of other musicians you know a lot of times not a lot yeah. of people get lucky they have to read something from a book and then all yeah, of a sudden no. now i actually get to talk to people that are living it and getting to learn like okay so what was it like for you it's so great when you can ask the question like what got you into music and a lot of people do answer the beatles but it's also like it's just so great to hear why they answer the beatles you know even though it's the same answer it's a different 
it's cool to see like different reasons and it's just something yeah. so rewarding, you know, with the, uh, the podcast that I do and the radio show and, uh, any uh, particular album you currently are listening to from any, uh, band from the past. It's like been on your, I always yeah. ask about that too. So what you've been, yeah. what you've been jamming well, to <laughs> uh, lately. It's been the who. Oh, there you go. I like the who. Yeah. I, I got, I got their, their last album came out and was it 2000? Oh, the one with, um, the, like the, yeah, that's a good one too. Cause it's later yeah. too. I'm trying to remember the name of it. I got it for my birthday and I'm trying to it, remember the name yeah, of it. It's, it's called, it's just called who that's right. That's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah there was, all this uh, music must fade and. Yeah. And um, what else? Down and Rob Tobin, whatever. You know. Yeah. But it'll, it'll definitely a nice uh, Pete Townsend type. <laughs> like, you just know yeah, he's great stuff. He's got good vocals, too. He's one of the coolest. Yeah. Yeah. My favorite Who album is either Tommy, Who Sell Out, or um, uh, Quadrophenia. Those are my favorite top uh, albums. You know, just having them spun and just all the time. I love concept music. So yeah. it's so cool. Oh, like, yeah. you could just put it on a record player, you know, put that needle down, and you're uh, you're stuck into a story. It's like, it's like yep. being read I, to you, but you could sing along, you know. <laughs> yeah, I got a, I have a whole bunch of Who albums. Got, uh, all the, I got all the stuff with Keith Moon. Oh wow! I won't buy anything with Kenny Jones or. Yeah, I'm more of the early you know. myself. Um, yeah. I, I think I have one or two with just, just because it's just in the collection, you know, for completion purposes. But I'm more of a definitely a Keith Moon collector, and I love. Um, yeah. I really like John Entwistle's solo career. Whistle Rhymes yeah. is a fantastic album. Uh, Apron Strings is one of my top favorite songs. And yep. uh, just to wonder who that guitarist was, there's a lot of theories that it's uh, Peter Frampton. But I have a feeling yeah. I think it's the roadie. I think it's the Who's roadie because he, plan- oh, he wow. played on that Heaven and Hell with that weird like psychedelic version that they did with the heavy guitars. And yeah. that was him. So I'm wondering if it's him. But a lot of people say it's Peter Frampton. So there's no like liner notes or anything. It's it's great when the uh, bands don't do liner notes at all. And you just have yeah, to leave guessing who's on what. Yep. <laughs> yep. Who's it's, on who? Uh, yeah. Who who's on it? who? There we go. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I know mostly it's been like uh, for me, it's been a trip going back. I listen to the Grateful Dead once in a while, too, because I'm not I'm not I love yeah. jam bands. I'm in a jam band myself. But a lot of times I just like those nice two minute radio songs that are boom, boom, boom 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 and as a, a radio host it's sometimes it's tough to uh you know differentiate like the um <laughs> you get you know i get songs <laughs> sent all the time and it's like you know you want the three four minute ones but then i'll throw a seven minute cactus song on there with heavy guitars and gems and everything and i'm like yeah i'm back into the grateful dead again <laughs> yeah <laughs> they don't they don't yeah. go away oh uh, you're from huh. california right well i was born in new okay. jersey and I grew up in Pennsylvania. And, oh, wow. And then I joined the Navy, and I was West Coast ever since. Oh, wow. What was yeah. it like uh, uh, moving over from the West Coast from the East Coast? Was it a shock back then, like going across, you know, doing things mm, like that? Or was it kind of like, this is just the of, way it's moving? <laughs> kind of. It was kind of different, you know, like seeing different things and stuff, you know. And, um, you know, I, I lived in Hawaii for about Ooh. seven and a half years. So I went from a Howley to a Hapa Howley. Which wow. is basically, you know, a howley is a, a way of saying foreigner or white guy, or whatever. Gotcha. And then a hapa howley is a is a white guy that's accepted by the locals because uh, <laughs> I started getting into their music and I even met some of the uh, performers out there like Kaylee Reichel. And oh wow! Kelly Boy De Lima from Capena. Uh, who else? Uh, I worked with uh, Mackie Fury and Kirk Thompson from Kalapana. Oh okay. Uh, they're they're like the Beatles of Hawaii back in the Ooh. 70s, and I got their first album. Well, very and, uh, cool. I'd love to hear that sometime. I'll have to look that up. If, if I'm able to. If yeah. not, I'll be begging you for some files. <laughs> be like, hey, I'll oh, play yeah. on the radio show. But yeah. no, that's really cool. I love that. It's like your own uh, tapioca tundra, you know, to quote Mike Nesmith a little bit from the monkeys. But uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it must have been a, a kind of a culture shock, but it seems like with music, it seems like you move along with it, and it kind of did it. Did it add to any of your like way of playing or songwriting? Did yeah, you have a lot of inspirations? It, it actually improved it. Wow, that's it, awesome. it actually improved it because, like you know, it developed my ear to the point where I could Ooh. play along with it, even though I didn't know what the song was. <laughs> you know, very kind of cool. weird. Yeah, it's yeah. like it's music theory in real life, you know. It's the, it's the yeah. real life version. Yeah. So I was just laughing. I was working with a person, um, this uh, Emily Ewing. We're doing a song together, um, and she's awesome. Very, she's very British, very cool. And I met her yeah. over the internet, power of the internet, which is awesome. <laughs> Can't be trouble though yeah. when you try to load up Facebook to call Jerry Steelfox for some reason, but 
it's all right. But it's working out. No, so we we yeah. uh, we called. We did like a little like hour session, and we wrote a song within an hour, which was really cool. I'm pretty good at like writing songs in under like an hour, but when working with somebody else, it usually takes a lot longer because you got to decide. Oh yeah. You know what you want in the yeah. song, and it's such a process that I first learned firsthand, and it, it is true. Learning things from other people and seeing places and all that, it definitely is a true statement to adding to your playing without even realizing, you know, there's great guitarists, but all of a sudden they go somewhere else. And now they're fantastic guitarists because it's yeah. just the mental side of it. Um, but she mentioned like not being able to do music theory. Is that okay? And I'm like, Oh, it's, yeah, it's definitely okay. I failed music theory in college. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm good with not doing, I mean, I know the basic stuff. I kept the book so I could like look up like the circle of fifths, know what notes yeah. work with what, because it's good to have a foundation, but I'm not one of those ones that are going to follow it to the T just cause I, I like experimenting. And if a note's wrong, I'll put it somewhere else in the song and it'll somehow find a way to work itself out. And if it doesn't work itself off, the song sits for, you know, a couple of weeks and then I'll go back to it. But we were able to write a song, you know, pretty basic you know, four chords with a bridge, which I guess in England they call yeah. a middle eight, which I did not know. Yeah. I was very yeah. surprised. Uh, so I learned mm -hmm. something new there and it was just very cool. And, um, yeah, something different, but it was very interesting because we were talking about the, the the music theory, and I was like, I bet you the Beatles, when they were sitting down, they weren't like, hey, John, what's the circle of fifths on this song? I don't yeah. think they cared. You know, they learned their chords by going across the country and learning new things, you know, because there was no internet back then, which, you know, yeah. that's a good question for you. What is it oh, like yeah, now like having the power of the internet to be able to do songwriting and sharing files uh, versus when you first started doing music? Uh, much of a different impact or? Oh, it's, it's cool. Yeah. Because uh, mm. I worked with a friend of mine based out of uh, New York and uh, he had an album. Uh, my friend Scott Katsura. Okay. You know, and uh, he had a, an album called Heavenly Rain. He was doing like a Christian type of thing, mm. whatever. And uh, he asked me to play guitar on it, and he'd sent me the files, and I'd laid something down. I'd ask him, what's the BPM or beats per minute, <laughs> yeah, the tempo? Yep. So that way I could, you know, make it sure he could link them up. Yeah. And all that. And then That's always out what, what key it's in. <laughs> That's like and the then, only uh, thing that makes it easier is having the BPM or the, you know, having that because without a doubt, you mean, if you had somebody recording in a different hire, it's like, ah, I can't sync this. <laughs> it becomes yeah. a headache, you know. Did you uh, do the mixing on your end to putting the instrument together, or did they? Um, did Scott do that on his end for when you oh, guys did well, the work together? I just I just laid down the uh, the guitar track, and I um, I sent him, you know, an idea of, of what it would sound like with effects, and then I sent him something flat, you know, with oh, no perfect. effects. Yeah, like, just make it like so where he can then add what he wants to it and make it shine, which is very cool. It's cool that you can yeah. put the effects on or take the effects off. I had a lot of people ask me to take the effects off because they want to work with their own, you know, ideas yeah. to it, which is very cool. It's cool that we yeah. can do that now. Yeah, it's definitely good with the Mac. You have GarageBand, you know. <laughs> yeah, and I also work with the. Uh, I uh, use Logic Pro. Oh, too, okay. So. Perfect. But uh, I just use that for post production oh. type stuff when it's already recorded. Yeah. They want to tweak my vocal and just run it through the auto tune and very cool. Fix it, you know. Sing like a bird, <laughs> even though it sounds like a turd. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's gonna be the cool. I'm gonna take that line right there, sings like, and put it right in the beginning of the podcast. So it'll flow right into the, like that'll be the highlight of the whole podcast. <laughs> yeah, I'm just messing around. Just be like people are like, what's this? You know, it'll, it'll catch everybody's attention. You know, no, it's been very um an interesting time period with everything going on. Did you find um with COVID and everything, did you find it hard to you know make music and go about your day, or did you make it you know with all the online make it a little easier to do what you needed to do uh, to get the music out well i was too busy working oh <laughs> working, i work in a hospital oh wow so it's like and uh, I've, I've had i've had like you know drive spell for like forever but mm. whatever ideas i do pop up with so like I, I pick up a guitar and strum a few chords like oh this sounds nice i just break out the phone <laughs> turn on the recorder just lay something down and then just save it you know yeah, it's much easier like, now to, it, to write down the ideas, you know, audio wise. It's it's hey, pop, boom, record. And you don't have to worry about, oh, I got to go pay for studio time to record myself because I got ideas, you know, you know, I'm on Reverb Nation, right? Yeah. Are you have a up on there, too? I think I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. Because so there's a, a whole list of songs on there. Oh. I think there's one called the uh, uh, what was it? The uh, Surfing Cowboy or something like that. It was a theme to uh, this radio show that's still on, actually, called Ooh. Brad Brad Mercer's Bands and Fans. It's broadcasted out here in Palm Springs. 
and uh, also cool. on the internet around the world. And uh, I wrote the uh, the main theme for the show. So, oh wow! It's been going for like five years. I How think. did that come about? How well, did you get offered that? That's pretty cool. Uh, well, I was I was friends with Brad. I met Brad through uh, mutual friends and stuff. You know, and just <sighs> hit it off. You know. So you'd say it's more yeah. about the networking nowadays, <laughs> knowing people yeah. and getting in. Yeah. But also, I mean, you're very talented. I've listened to a few. I heard the song Fascination before calling you. Um, how did that one come about? That was a great song to listen to. Uh, well, it just, uh, just, just came came about. I was like sitting in, sitting at the computer and <laughs> just like, you know, I had a few chords and I laid them down. Uh, a rough beat, like whatever mm-hmm. it was, you know. And then it just uh, worked it from there. And then I started writing the lyrics and stuff, you know, whatever came to my head. I just popped it in there. I was thinking, like, and do you, you do know, all the instrumentation as well, right? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I had no help. I'm wow. always playing by myself. You know. <laughs> the usual <laughs> musician story. I'm alone inside and I'm ready to play all the instruments. I love it. No, yeah. I uh, definitely for me, it's been a, I could do everything but drums. I have such a hard time with rhythm. I am a dancing fool, as Zappa would say, but I have no rhythm. I have everything else. And then when I play guitar, I have rhythm. It's a weird thing with drums. I just yeah. I can't do it. So if anybody that could play drums, man, did you uh, did any instrument ever prove a challenge to learn for you? Or have you been like pick it up and just get right to it? I know you play bass and you play all, you know, drums as well. Was drums tough yeah, for you? Bass, or? bass is a piece of cake for me. I could just walk it. You know, <laughs> That's awesome. I'd be goofing off on it. But um, uh, mandolin, mm. it, it, it proved to be a little bit of a challenge, but it's like I got I got over that hurdle real quick, you know. Cause I actually picked one up uh, during COVID to, uh, you know, just to play something different. And it is, it is a yeah. bit to learn, but like I'm good by ear, so it's really fun for me. I'm like, oh, I can just go all yeah. over. But if I want to sit down and learn any of the she shanties or any of the fun stuff, I'm like, I got to learn how to play this instrument. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was I was like felt like Peter Buck from, uh, <laughs> you know, from, from yeah. R.E.M., you know, doing losing my religion. Yeah, I'm still you learning know, that. that kinda... I'm still that's why I picked it up. And then all of a sudden I started putting on original songs and I was just yeah. like, I'm having more fun just doodling around. But I really wanted to learn like R.E.M. stuff because there's some really yeah. good mandolin playing from Peter Buck. I mean, yeah. probably one of the coolest. And then I also saw um, the guitarist of Ian Hunter's band live in New York. I saw him oh, wow. live. I uh, can't remember his name, and he's probably going to message me later and be like, oh, I saw the podcast, you know, and I, <laughs> you didn't remember my name, <laughs> but uh, I think it's yeah. James. I think it's James Mastro. I think that's his name. Uh, uh, but he was oh, such okay. a super nice guy, and he was playing mandolin, a uh, nice F hole, mm. like the F the F style with the, um, yeah, yeah. the curve, which I so want, but I want to make sure I'm good at mandolin before I get uh, because like I like the one I got. I got an Ibanez. I wasn't uh, too excited about Ibanez's packaging. I had to return the first one when they ordered it. The uh, nut was loose, so I couldn't oh, even wow. play it. So that was just the ordering process. And then I got the second yeah. one. It could have just been where I bought it from, too, but they're usually pretty good. So I, I, I doubt that maybe it was just the packaging. But the second one I got, they were like looking at it or like, it's good, it's good, it's good. So I'm like, all right, good. I'm bringing it home. And I packed it and everything's been great. <laughs> Oh, awesome. I got to get yeah. like a wall mount for it so I could put it right up like a guitar, like right up on the wall stand. Uh, just so I don't have to keep yeah. taking it out of the, the case. I mean, I got my Dan Electro right next to me at all times just so I have something to play next to uh, me. And I have a what, Gibson Which instrument. model do you got? Anyway. I have um, – so this is my dad's actually. I borrow his because we uh, – we, we cl- he collects a lot of the Dannys. Um, um, just – yeah, I guess it is the baritone. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. it's, it's something I- – that's why this guitar doesn't have the tone all the time that I need. <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, yeah, I have I have a ninety nine. Uh, you know, uh, it was the reissue when they first came out. You know. Yeah. Uh, it's a uh, the uh, the U two. You know. That's what I think like this is, U- but I'm not sure. Um, but that's they awesome. had the U one. The U one had the one pickup, one lipstick pickup. Oh this yeah, this has U2. the uh, this has um two. There's the double at the bottom, and then there's the one at the top. So oh, it might be the yeah, two. Yeah, like a humper dinker yeah. or whatever. Yeah, I love the like stick pickups. I use in a couple of my songs. You can hear the tone difference because I usually use an SG on my recordings, but I yeah. like to use the Dan Electro for leads because you get that surf sound. And then I like oh, using yeah. the the Gibson for the heavy, you know, instrumental. But then there's times I'll switch it around, and I'm like, why does this sound so? Because it's a baritone. <laughs> you solved my <laughs> yeah. Dan Electro issue. And then I have a Takamine. Um, 
uh, 12 string because I love playing 12 string. I'm big inspiration because of the birds, you know. Yeah, yeah. I enjoy playing the 12 string and uh, just kind of having fun. And I like putting it on the albums and putting it in the left ear or on the right ear doubled up and just throwing it in the mix somewhere, even in, if it's just in the background. Um, but I definitely, Dan Electros have been the go to. And I'm probably going to get an electric 12 string, Danny. Yeah, some point. I just don't have the here. money for a Rick. <laughs> yeah, I, I I used to have a 330 12 string. Ooh. Uh, but I, I it was like, it just become cumbersome to play, you know. It was like, it was harder, getting harder and harder to play because the, the, the neck on is like a baseball bat. <laughs> like if you ever tried like a, a 360, you know, 12 yeah. string or whatever. And uh, I was like, oh my God. Yeah, they're all, so, like, it's like I a used personal. It for, a while you know mm-hmm. but uh i had a i had like maybe four or five rickenbackers in my day Whew. you yeah. know you know back then but, uh, i wish that i know a lot of people well, especially with beatles they all wanted to go buy the ricks the hoffman you know the hoffners not the hoffman hoffners uh, we're not buying uh you know yeah. hoffman but uh <laughs> <laughs> the Hoffners oh, yeah. and uh, you know it's just something I want to get a Hoffner um, looking into getting one like in the $500 range because I have an Ibanez bass that I enjoy playing I'm, I'm a good bass player in yeah. studio but live I'm still getting better yeah. like I'm really good in studio you put the headphones on I'm up and down the neck boom, 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 you know all over the place I know what I'm doing and I know oh, my yeah. notes I know my notes very well on the bass which helped me with my guitar playing of course yeah. too um, but with when I go live I get because it's not my instrument that I'm so used to being on a stage with, it's tough for me. And so like, I have a buddy yeah. that needs a bass player and I was like, I'll step up to the plate. I'll try out. And he goes, actually, we're not looking at the moment. He goes, but good to know. And I was like, good. Cause I would like to try out. I would definitely be interested um, just to sit in the background once in a while. It's sometimes good to be in the background and learn things. And I would love to just be the backbeat. Yeah. But I'm like, at least with that, I could just, he's mostly a blues guy. So it's the simple, you know, progressions and uh, you know, oh, but, yeah. I could love to be able to, you know, take that and then go off of it and go, you know, like the birds. I mean, the birds, eight miles high, a prime example of insanely yeah. good bass playing uh, from Chris Hellman. Oh, it's yeah. like, oh, my God. And it's just like so cool. Yeah. I know that that's one of my favorite bass playing, especially the live version um, from uh, Untitled and Unissued. Uh, Lover of the Bayou, too, was oh, really wow. good from that. Yeah. Um, been a big nice. fan of the birds for a while. <laughs> Thanks to my oh, dad. Oh yeah, and uh, actually, it's funny. I got, <laughs> I got records on my walls, and one of them is Big Star. I like their stuff too. Very, uh, you know, Alex Chilton box tops, but way later. Cool. And I love all that oddball nice. stuff, and it's just so much fun uh, looking around and being able to be absorbed by music all the time. But also, it's good to take breaks. <laughs> I tell all my yeah, viewers yeah. the same thing, but it's hard when it's in your blood, you know, and I sense it's probably in your blood as well with doing music and it's a part of your life that it just doesn't disappear, yeah. you know? So yeah, the song, base to oh, buy though, if, you, if you're mm-hmm. interested in buying Hoffners, yeah. get the ignition. They are good? The ignition baser. Okay. Yeah, they're fantastic. They sound was, more like the 500 slash one. Oh, wow. I did not you know, know that. I was I was like going, yeah. not getting them. I wanted to spend more, but that's actually good to hear because those are cheaper too, which is yeah. nice. I, oh, I used it on a, a record uh, that I did with uh, Rick Fallon. And it's like, man, this is like way cool. Great. Well, I sound. like the idea that it's lighter too. When you're sitting in studio and you don't have much room around you, yeah. it's nice to have a Hoffner yeah. just like picking it up and just playing basically what's there. Where with the Ibanez, it's a little bigger and I'm just like trying to bump into things. I'm like, I don't want to bump the guitar and I'm, I'm all getting all worried because I'm very protective of my gear and I'm just like, oh, God. Yeah. But with the Hoffner, it's like what I've seen and seeing them I'm like, oh, they're nice and like tiny for studio. Yeah. They're perfect. Oh, yeah, and I, short, thank you for telling me that. Neck. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. so much easier to be able to do, you know. Yeah, I like the you know, it's funny that I have the Danny out next to me. I'm probably gonna switch it now for the, the Gibson as the basic guitar that sits out because it's easier, but I the convertible is really nice too. I just gotta get it. I gotta get it uh the way that the bridges are on the convertibles are weird. They have like a thing where it's yeah. like tilted a certain way. So my dad fixed it it made it straight but now it's buzzing again and i'm like ah uh, we got to put uh, it back the other way so it's it's just we were trying to experiment around to see what would fit and it sounds good when it's yeah. plugged into an amp there's no issues oh yeah but it's a convertible yeah. you know you kind of want to have the yeah. acoustic and the electric so when it's plugged in it's perfectly fine and i have a blues oh, yeah. junior tube amp so i'm cranking it over here in my small little mobile home it's like i gotta keep the volume low as the windows don't shatter you know but yeah uh, oh yeah it's always fun but I, I love that. Yeah. And I love the fact that like uh, with the, the convertible, I just love the colors that Danny has. The Dan Electro colors are insanely cool and very, again, very California surfy type colors. Yeah. 
and I'm, I'm sure the Beach Boys had Dan Electro's too. I think they, well, they used to have the Sears, the Silver Tone, and then Dan Electro was their parent company then too, I believe. Oh yeah, so I really I got cool. one of those too. Ooh, the Silver Tone, but uh, it it's the newer one. You oh, know, okay. it has the newer bridge on it. But uh, I Still just cool. love the sound of it. You know. Yeah. Because uh, like for amplifiers, I got like, oh my god, I got a <laughs> Laney VC30. Ooh. And uh, it looks more like an AC-15 because it had that brown mm. toll lux yeah. that you see on the on the Vox amps. It's like, oh, I got to get it, even though it's used. And I just love the <laughs> you overdrive. Just have it. Oh, Sounds- yeah. Oh, those yeah. overdrives are sweet. I got a pedal <laughs> that's got like a really cool. Light. So I was talking to one of my buddies who's like big into processors and he's in my bad finger yeah. band with me and he's like in his 50s. He's really awesome. And I was like. Yo, I need a processor because I'm having a tough time linking my pedals together. I just the sound isn't what I want. It's very muddy. You know, I'll try it one day. It's great. The next day it's not. Well, at least with the yeah. processor, it's built in. You know, everything's there. Yeah. So I got a very simple one for sixty three dollars in free shipping because they were having a sale. Uh, their brand is called wow. Sonic Cake and they're huh. brand new. They just like came out, I think, in a couple years ago. And it's uh, it's basically a Twiggy Blues pedal. So it has the slapback, mm-hmm. the reverb, the uh, distortion, which is just like more of a like just kind of a nice overdrive. It's not too much, yeah. which I like. Yeah. And, and then it has a compression all in one. Oh, nice. And you get to switch what you want. You could select, you know, what you want. You don't have to use all four at the same time. It's not just like one pedal with all of it built into what they designed. You can mess around with it. You yeah. can have the Pink Floyd delay where it's delayed all out into space. <laughs> Or you could have yeah, yeah. like, a, um, you know, mix in between everything. And it's just something so interesting to have. It's all built in one and I can use it again as a, and it also has an amp monitor. So you could plug it into a PA without an amp. So like if I go to an open oh, mic, wow. I just plug it right into whatever they have. They're like, we have, so I have like an instant amp in my hand, which is nice yeah. for traveling. It's very nice. <laughs> I don't have yeah, to worry about bringing a big, cool. big heavy tube amp for $63. I was like, whoa. I was like, once we get bigger as a record label, I'm going to have these guys sponsored somehow. <laughs> I want to help them yeah. because it's just something that made me a better guitarist, too, because it was just fun to work with. And I was getting the tones that I actually wanted. And uh, and I also learned about ear fatigue. I never knew that was a thing when working in the yeah. studio. It's like you could have a really good song. And then 10 days later, you're like throwing it out because it's just too much. And then you're like, yeah. wait, my ears are just tired. <laughs> Yeah, you can only mix for so long. Yeah. You have to take a break, you know, come back to it later on, you know. And I didn't realize that as being young and and just into it. Like, I want to do everything now. And I'm just like the way that I have the attitude of everything instantaneous. And, you know, it's hard to work through that. It's because everybody my age is that way. (laughs) It's just the way it is. But it's just it's fun to like figure out. I think music is teaching me patience, you know, and I'm big into Star Wars. So maybe it's like the Jedi way of doing things, patience. And it's like, (laughs) it's just the way it is. Yeah, that's the thing with me. I don't have patience when I'm (laughs) I'm working on a project or whatever. It's like I want to get it done quick. Yeah. And then when you bring others involved, it becomes a whole different yeah. story. I'm very much I, I write like nonstop. I can write a song in like 20 minutes, maybe even 10 minutes sometimes yeah. if it's a simple one. And uh, and then I get stumped when I start working with others because then there's like, you know, other ideas and everything. I've been very blessed by the team that I have. I have a lot of uh, really cool guys that they'll work with what I need and what I want. And then they'll throw their ideas my way. And I'm usually like pretty accepting because I like seeing other you know ways things can go. But sometimes yeah. there's like a one song you get like so like this is my baby and you're like I can't have anybody else's opinions but I've worked through it as I got older and I've been so much now I'm at the point where my name is Jeb musically and it used to be I, that was my yeah. nickname now it's become a band that everybody's Jeb now <laughs> that works with me like we it's become such a project oh, wow. that I don't even own anymore it's like its own thing and it's such a collaborative now which is so yeah. fun to me and then that's what made the record label such an easy idea to do because it's like a lot of artists they want to get out there and get their music out but they're having a tough time with this industry and I like the business side of things yeah. weirdly I actually get very I like the puzzle behind it I like trying to figure out what works yeah. for marketing one day and what doesn't um I get frustrated yes <laughs> but I, I also it's, when it's very rewarding when you get one of your artists on a chart and it's very rewarding when you have a yeah. radio host that keeps playing their music. And then I'm also a radio host as well, you know, for, for me, the show. So it's fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, for me, I've been on Reverb Nation mm-hmm. for about, I guess, four years, I think it was. And I never left the top 10. Wow. Never. I'm at number three. I'm still at number that's three. Awesome. You know, it's like, is that for your area or is that uh, for all of like all of just for, Nation? for my area? Oh, that's cool. For my area. I'm at, yeah. Singer songwriter. That's I awesome. I don't have to do anything. Just they do it for you. <laughs> yeah. 
See, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, my uh, buddy uh, Tim Longden is one of the top ones here in Connecticut for it. And he was telling me about it. And I saw that it's like, it's not a bad thing. Like, this is pretty cool. It's way better yeah. than trying to get your music on Spotify where you get paid, what, a fraction of a, you know, something, you know, it's, yeah. it's crazy. And it's so cool to see something where you like, you, you know, you just have them help you with the marketing side and see, I, I love doing it. I'm like, uh, you know, the manual drive of the marketing side. I love inter uh, networking with people. It's always been a trade of mine before I even started playing music. And yeah. uh, I love the networking side of things. I love uh, having the uh, opportunities that I have meeting artists like yourself and just being able to do the show, which is so cool. And such a reward yeah. for the idea of like, wow, I live in a small town that like no one, no one here. There's no record label here, you know, and it's yeah. it's it, and in Connecticut, there's only a few, you know, there's there's a lot here, but they're not around me, which is awesome because less competition, which I like. Oh, yeah. But we're online. You know, we work with a lot of really on like cool folks from all over the world. And we're really close with uh, Big Stir Records. They're kind of a hot, hot thing in California as they're getting a lot of attraction from the Power Pop crew. So if you haven't heard of them yet, check out their releases. Uh. They're really cool. Um, I've yeah. interviewed some of their bands. They're working right now with actually Tony St uh, Tony Valentino of the Standells. He's actually working with them currently mm. on uh, releases and stuff. I'm doing a song with Tony, and I really thank him for his patience. I have been having such a hard time writing it. I don't know what's happening. And usually I'm really good at writing, but I am stumped on this one. So I'm like trying to. I'm yeah. actually hiring a writing partner, aka my best friend who I write with, and he'll just get the royalties. <laughs> We'll make it work yeah. that way. That's how we usually work. Yeah, well, sp speaking of the Standells, yeah, the keyboard player from that band, uh, Russ Tamblin's brother. Yeah, yeah. Well, I requested a fan request with him on Ooh. Facebook, and like, he's like, do you know, do I know you? It's like, no, but I like your band. And I, it's like, <laughs> he used to be signed with the Tower Records, I think it was, oh, back wow. in the 60s, right? Yeah. And uh, I have a friend that was in the band, the Moonrakers. Oh, okay. They were with the same label. That's cool. Uh, his name's uh, Vitor Van Dorn. Okay. And me and Vitor like I'll have to check them out. friends, you know. I like the name. Yeah. I like that. It's very, uh, very psychedelic sounding. <laughs> yeah. I like that. But, uh, I know some people yeah, on was, Facebook, you'll add them. And it's like, I understand like once you get into like the leagues of like being in like the big networking thing, you know, like knowing people, yeah. you start to run across people like you never thought had a Facebook or like, you know, they had a Facebook, but you're like, do I feel bad sending a friend request to this person? Because I'm like, they're kind of big, yeah. you know. But I've noticed that a lot of people are usually pretty, you know, pretty cool about it. Um, like recently, yeah. I, uh, Vinny Zumo and I became friends uh, from Joe Jackson's band. But he also does yeah. a lot of stuff on his own. And Vinny and I became really close. And I like his music and everything. I got to get him up on the show at some point, too. It's just I've been so with my schedule and everything. It's like you could hear as soon as we started, I'm much more relaxed now, able to talk than I was in the beginning. Because I'm like, ah, God, time just flies. Because today I was like, I tried to get our yeah. website done at one o'clock. So I had enough time to get our questions ready and make sure had a really good show going and and everything and, and then all of a sudden i'm on the website my dad comes home and he's help with the tractor and i'm like oh i gotta do that you know i gotta help out and i'm like uh -huh. this time just flew <laughs> but it's just been oh, the yeah. weather is nicer yeah, yeah. today too so everybody's you know, everybody's got that spring fever almost summer fever here so it's that classic like it yeah. feels we have the false summer in connecticut and then all of a sudden we'll have snow mm. and like out of nowhere yeah <laughs> so it's like new england is weird oh wow yeah, New England weather yeah. is uh, one of those interesting things. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if uh, if it's on the Reverb Nation mm -hmm. page or not. Uh, there's a song called "It's Never Enough." Okay. Um, anyway, the backstory between from that was I was uh, you know I'd be sending off tracks to my friend in Hawaii. He's a record producer out there, and I've worked on several projects with him mm -hmm. in the over the years. You know, and he'd, he'd like giving me hell on the thing. You know, on the <laughs> a reply. They're just like, this is too loud and this was too soft and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, I just, something just snapped in my head as I got all pissed off and I started writing. And it was like going with all these weird chords. Andy loves the song because of uh, like, it has like a, <laughs> the chord changes are like that of like classical gas from Mason oh, Williams, wow. you know. But um, the backstory from that was I was, I was like, you know, writing it and all that stuff. And I, I was like, I'm going to send this to Mamie Van Doren for a kickoff. You know, <laughs> oh. you know who she is, right? She sounds very familiar. Yeah, she was one of the three M's. It was Marilyn Monroe, oh, Jane wow. Mansfield, and her. Okay. Yep, she was a, she's an icon. Big time. I wow. talked to her a few times on the phone. You know, she's like 90 years old now. But anyway, <laughs> I sent her the song, 
and she really liked that like the the music of it and there do you think you could write it in a female point of view like hmm. a, a woman scorn or something like that it's like i think i can yeah let me grow some tits and, <laughs> and see what i can do yeah so it, it just started to come come to me and it was like it became a torch song oh, of wow. sorts and then she loved it and uh, she was due to do a show at the uh, Greek theater with uh, this band called Pink Martini. Okay. And uh, she wanted to give the band this music. You know, it was like, can oh, you do wow. this song for me? It's like, my friend Jerry Steel Fox wrote it. And it's like, <laughs> a great, beautiful song. But uh, they didn't have sheet music, so they couldn't do it. It's like, oh, well. That would have been, that been uh, neat, that having been my really music cool. played at the Greek theater. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a legendary so, venue right there. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. But, uh, yeah. yeah, she was a big influence on that song. So, and uh, I also so cool. got a, a <laughs> one song uh, called uh, "What Is It um, Tranquility?" I think it's called. Okay. Yeah, it's an instrumental track, and she uh, is there. Can I use it for a YouTube video? Yeah, sure. It's called November Beach. Hmm. It's just like a slideshow that her husband Thomas put together, and oh. you hear the music on it, and there's yeah. like a little introduction wow. about me and all that. So, That's always cool as a musician like too to get hits, like, I think. Ooh, yeah, it's always cool as a musician to get yeah. hit with like those where somebody inspires you, and then to be able to talk to that inspiration is beyond like a full circle effect of a song, which is something so unique for people that a lot of people I've heard don't get, you know, that opportunity. And it's just so cool that I get to hear that from a lot of our guests, and it's just something so different. You know, I've been lucky with uh, Paul Chastain, which is recently on the radio show, and that was a full effect because his buddy is John Richardson. Um, John Richardson. Yeah is in Joey Mullen's Badfinger. Like after Badfinger was done, they had the oh. three different Badfinger yeah. bands, which I'm so confused, but it went, you know, terrible, terrible <laughs> story. I understand it could be crazy, cause crazy things. But uh, after they were done around after the split with the eighties before Tommy passed, um, they had the three different bands yeah. and it was uh, Craig, I believe was the guy's name or Bob. I can't remember exactly who, I think it was Bob, Craig or Bob. I can't remember. My, my mm. buddy's going to kill me. I should know this because it's a tribute band and everything, but one of the guys that was new, he was the guitarist that replaced um, Joey, uh, did his own Badfinger cover band. Then Joey had his, and then um, Tommy had one of his own. Well, I guess John Richardson played with the one that, that Joey had. So I was talking with John over checks. I was like, yeah, your buddy yeah. Paul was on my show and everything. And what a really cool guy. And he also played with the Jim Blossoms, which are a newer band, which I love uh, from the, the 90s, late 90s. Yeah, I'm friends with Rob Wilson's brother, Lee. Ah. Kind of weird. Kind of weird, huh? I've never <laughs> met Bob, Robert yet, so... Yeah, one of, the, one of the coolest bands. I love that band uh, so much. And I want to see them live, yeah. but every time they come around, the tickets are usually too high. And it's like, ugh. yeah, I'm going to see Paul McCartney, so I shouldn't complain about ticket prices, but oh, I've yeah. never seen oh. Paul, so I kind of want to, <laughs> you know, it's something I, I, yeah. I'm okay with spending. Well, Andy met Paul. Really? So. Is that in his book, too? I think That's, we talked about yeah. some of that. I know it's been a while since the podcast, yeah. and I remember he mentioned so many cool names um, being, I mean, Harry Nielsen as well. And hey, I love the fact that Ringo and I think Paul must have been with yeah. him too. It might have been the same story, but Ringo's just sitting in his house and, and just sitting there. And I'm like, I would be screaming yeah. internally like a god of rock here is just sitting there. No shoes on. No shoes on. That's right. Yep. Yeah. It's like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> you get to hang out with Ringo. Ringo's coming um, on like, the same day I signed for a fair. So I'm like, ah, oh, because I would have bought tickets. It's cheap for him. It's the Edgar Winner is going to be with him. Yeah. Edgar Winner. It's the whole Ringo, you know, the all star band. And it's so oh, exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Their drum tech, I know personally. Uh, he's uh, from the the band The Posies. He's the original drummer, but he was also in a couple other bands, uh, Mike Mushberger. And he oh, is nice. the drum tech for Ringo. And uh, he basically is, hmm. uh, he was, I, so I texted him. I was like, are you, cause we're, we're close to a point. Like I could, if I text him, he's like, Oh, Hey, fan of my other brand. How's it going? You know, we're not like best friends or anything, but uh, I was talking to him and yeah. I wanted to have him do drums for me at some point too. So we've been talking about that, but he's like, I'll be up in Connecticut in September. And I said, Oh, great. You know, the chance of a lifetime to probably meet Ringo, but I'm more excited just to meet him. He's, you know, he's a cool guy and he's a good drummer yeah. too. And so I said, sure, dude, I'll take you yeah. out to lunch or something. And he was like, sure. And then I look at the date and I'm like, 
Oh, 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 I signed a contract to play a fair, which I'm very excited about because this is my oh. first ever fair I've ever played. You know, this is going to be I'm one night I'm doing solo yeah. acoustic for four hours. So I'm I'm taking one of the artists from Robo Jack, our record label, and he's going to play with me. So he gets two hours and I get two hours. So it'll be a nice, you know, everybody gets a taste of both of our sides of acoustic. Then the next day at the same fair, I'm playing yeah. again with my psych band and we're doing uh, a lot of jams and just psyching out and just having fun for two hours. I'm like, hell yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'll take it. What a what a great, great opportunity to have. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, we'll keep in contact, cool. too. I would love to talk more music with you anytime. Have a good one, Jerry. Oh, OK, sounds great. man. Have a good one. All right. You just listened to the podcast section of all the questions we've been asking. We're going to move on to now the songs. I did it separately. I wanted to give Jerry some more time. And we also did this as an Unlikely Places special. So you might have already heard this. But here we are. So the first song I have here, Make Up Your Mind. Tell me about that one. Oh, well, anyway, that one that was has like three different versions, but it was basically about a this relationship of a, a girl that they knew, you know, and all that. And uh, oh, <laughs> she she dropped me like a bad habit and all that because uh, she was like unsure. She like this guy, like that guy, and all uh. that. That's where that's where the uh, the line make, making love, whatever, you know, mm-hmm. trying to find love, whatever. And she's like unsuccessful and all that, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> trying to. Making love that isn't there. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Fascination. Tell me about that one. That's my favorite track of yours so far. <laughs> uh, well, I wrote that one for my girlfriend Mindy. Oh. That I'm, um, I've been with her for about four years, and she's the bee's knees. <laughs> she's always been good to me and all that. So it's like you know, I just wanted to write a song for the only how much I love her, you know, and everything. She's such a sweet girl. Perfect. You know.
And then next I have Drive Me to Tears. Drive Me to Tears. That, that was written, co-work written with uh, Rod Martin. Ooh. And um, I, um, I just, it was like, the original title was uh, uh, F Me to Tears. <laughs> I just, let's just say that, keep it PG rated, gotcha. you know. But um, anyway, it was, uh, you know, I showed, I showed it to Rod. And he, he came up with some lyrics and stuff like that. And then uh, it was like, basically, in a nutshell, I was just writing about myself, you know, because uh, I was married before. And um, and it just basically says everything about her, you know. Mm. It's like, who the heck do you think you are, you know, thinking you're a movie star? Because she's like, just looking around like, look at me, look at me. I'm so beautiful and all that. And... <laughs> and uh, and then she had the the bridge part, you know, the middle eight, as you like to call it. Yeah. Um, now that I'm insane, I'll have you to blame. Was basically um, her saying that to me. Oh. But uh, she used to be on all, all these different pills. You know, she'd be taking so many pills, oh, she'd geez. rattle like a maraca, <laughs> bipolar. You know how it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's it. <laughs> I have Dreamscape. What's that one about? Dreamscape is uh, instrumental. I was uh, I was like watching a, a Quentin Tarantino movie, mm. and uh, I was thinking like a western, and it was th- you know seeing like in my mind like a aerial shot of horses galloping, you know, like a whole bunch of yeah. horses running out in a field, and uh, I, sh- I, sh- I sh- shopped it around. I showed it to my producer friend Pierre Grill. And is there, yeah, you should put that on a on a TV show, you know, like a news show or whatever. But uh, nothing ever transpired with it. I got it, cop, you know, copywritten, mm-hmm. and I have it published through my uh, ri- my uh, BMI. And yeah, gotcha. With, uh, so, but uh, yeah, but maybe uh, that's somebody will pick it up happened. now because they're hearing it on the radio yeah. show. There we go. <laughs> I hope so.
And next cool. up, I have uh, Nirvana. What's that one about? Nirvana. Uh, was uh, <clears throat> um, had uh, that line in there. Me. Uh, it sounded like something that Kurt Cobain would sing, <laughs> you know. And it was just layered, you know. It was like it just, I came up with the two different chords and stuff like that. And it was like trying to write a song. I had the two verses. And then the last verse, I was like stuck. How can I? How can I resolve this? So I just gave it a throwaway line. You know, morning comes, time to arise. Uh, going to work and cook me some fries because uh, I worked in a hospital. I still do, actually. You know, as a cook. So. Next up, I have My Only One. My Only One. Uh, that's a love song that was co-written with um, Rod Martin again. Huh. And uh, I, I usually, usually, you know, I come up with the music, you know, and then uh, it was like have a little scat melody, whatever, and I send it off to Rod and he takes a look at it. And then, uh, you know, he just takes it from there and writes the lyrics. And uh, then he sends me what he's got. And then uh, I just fix it up a little bit and then i sing it you know perfect yeah that's what yeah all those tracks that you hear uh i did uh, all the instrumentation on it all the arrangements as far as like strings and horns and such like so And 
like the night to rest my mind I turn to you and then I find the magic in your kiss your What about happy song inspirations behind that one happy song was just uh it was based off of a song that i had uh written about 1999 no no probably 2002 mm. yeah called uh here comes the rain and i tried recording it at um rendezvous studios in honolulu hawaii Ooh. with my friend pierre grill and uh it's like the music's good but i the lyrics are kind of like you know you know, total opposite, you know, because it's a happy sounding song. And it's like, here comes the rain falling down. <laughs> it's like my heart's broken. So it's like, I just said, heck on it. I'll just make it an instrumental. So I just like laid laid down the tracks on my own and, and added the horns and all that stuff. You know, it's just something I wrote. So. Yeah.
got two more left. You got you and me. What's that one about? You and me was uh, just uh, some off the cuff type tune. You know, that it was like brain to the paper type deal. I was thinking like Lennon, John Lennon. You know, trying to yeah. be John Lennon when I wrote that one. So, but uh, yeah, just whatever came to my mind went in the paper. I didn't care how it went. But people seem to like it, you know, so whatever. It's a good tune. It's a good tune, yeah. yeah. today's show uh with a perfect world what's that one about perfect world was a uh, i wrote that song in like 15 minutes <laughs> and um it was a uh, the uh, inspiration came from the movie uh what dreams may come that's that movie with uh cuba gooding jr oh, okay. and robin williams oh yeah. it's like a big old painting so to speak like that's where i had pastel shades of blue and uh, ah. my friend Rod Martin, he couldn't understand, right? why'd you write something like that? And I wrote this all on my own, it's like pastel, you know, <laughs> it just sounded good. So I just threw it in there, recorded the basic tracks at uh, my friend Ed Todd's studio. And um, then I, I took the multi tracks and sent them off to Rendezvous Studio in, uh, in Honolulu, Hawaii, and my friend Pierre... He uh, he laid down piano and, and the strings, and then I I like kind of embellished it a little bit more by adding a little bit more violin to it. Ah, and and that was it, you know. Well, perfect. So. Yeah. I see clouds of 
Thank you, Jerry, yeah. for coming on again. Uh, we'll we'll, th- <laughs> we'll throw the original podcast out there as well in co- future coming weeks. But this one is just for the radio show here for you. And Jerry will be on the podcast in a couple weeks as I edit that one up as well. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.